Hello there, very good evening and a warm welcome to the news live on Rupoin Channel Live. I'm Sharon Maskarinas. Good evening, I'm Clifford Richards. First of all, we take a look at the headlines. The president says that a new agricultural revolution, which is not against the nature, is needed. The inter-provincial passenger transportation services are being carried out as usual. Provision of the Pfizer vaccine as a booster dose begins. The Venerable Nyanasara Thera clarifies on the One Country, One Law program. The Minister of Agriculture says paddy cultivation in 70% of the lands in the Maha season has commenced. Moving on to the stories in detail. President Gotabe Rajapaksha emphasized the imperative need for the new agricultural revolution that is not against nature. The president made these remarks addressing a special conference organized by Sri Lanka on the sidelines of the United Nations Climate Change Conference known as COP26 in Glasgow yesterday. Well, the president also pointed out that the people should coexist with the nature rather than acting against it. The conference was held under the theme Rediscovering Nitrogen Solutions and Synergies for Climate Change, Health, Biodiversity and Secular Economy. As we are all aware, Climate change is one of the greatest crises the world currently faces. The leaders of nearly all countries are meeting over the next two days to discuss and hopefully commit to actions that will start leading us out of it. For decades, chronic kidney disease has been a serious issue in Sri Lanka's agricultural heartland. The overuse of chemical fertilizers has contributed significantly to this problem. It is in this context that my government took firm steps to reduce imports of chemical fertilizer and strongly encourage organic agriculture. The challenge facing us now is to use modern scientific techniques and practices to enhance agricultural production without causing environmental degradation. We require a new agricultural revolution that has sustainability at its core. My government's policy frameworks emphasize sustainability. This is reflected in Sri Lanka's ambitious, updated, nationally determined contributions to the UNFCC mechanism. Sri Lanka's progressive agenda on the environment is despite the resource constraints it faces as a developing nation. Sustaining such an agenda alongside development programs is challenging for all developing nations, especially following the pandemic. I therefore hope that developed countries will extend their fullest support to such nations through development assistance technology transfers, skills development, investment, and financing support. There is also a significant role for businesses in this endeavor and significant returns to be made in investments into sustainability. All of us alive today are custodians of this planet on behalf of future generations. We must all work together towards ensuring its health by contributing in whatever way we can. If we all do this in a spirit of togetherness and goodwill, I'm certain we will succeed in effecting positive change for our people and our planet. Let me appreciate all scientists, late and alive, for their work on nitrogen. Centuries after discovering nitrogen, we are rediscovering nitrogen again. Sri Lanka became the first country in the world to take the decision to convert conventional agricultural lands 100% organic. As a result of courageous decision taken by His Excellency the President Gotabe Rajapaksha, a presidential task force was established. It aims to create a green socio-economy with sustainable solutions for climate changes. I am honored to be its chair. 
The interprovincial train services have recommenced today with the removal of travel restrictions. Interprovincial bus services have also resumed as usual. Meanwhile, administering of the booster dose under the COVID immunization program has begun with effect from today. Minister Dr. Kelly Rambukwela says that it has become possible to provide the booster vaccine to people in Sri Lanka at a time when only a limited number of countries in the world are engaged in administering the booster vaccine as a third vaccine. The minister further points out that only two or three countries in the world are delivering the booster dose. The booster dose will be given initially to frontline staff in the health divisions. The Pfizer booster vaccine are being inoculated on persons six months after receiving the second dose of the COVID control vaccine. The booster dose will be inoculated later on according to the priority list on group of persons. Delivering of the booster dose on army officials have commenced at the army hospital in Narayanpita today. Vaccination of health employees is being conducted at the relevant hospitals. Accordingly, vaccinating of staff at the Lady Ridgeway Children's Hospital has taken place at the hospital premises today. Another program of delivering the booster vaccine got underway at the Office of Medical Office of Health in Piliandala today. Buses and trains have arrived in Colombo from outstations with the recommencement of interprovincial bus and train services. These passenger transportation services are being conducted according to health guidelines. Train transport to the southern province from the western province is also being carried out on a regular basis. The roadblock at the Bentara Bridge has been removed. Passenger transportation of buses have also been normalized. Recommencement of train transport from Beliata to Colombo has also taken place. Activities at Markumura Multipurpose Transportation Centre has also resumed today. Bus transport in the Southern Expressway is also taking place. Office transport services to the towns of Gaul, Kandy, Ratnapuru, Kurunagala and Chilau has recommenced from the National Transport Commission in Narempita today. Minister Pavitra Vanyarachi has presided over the event of redeployment of bus services. The buses which travel to the provinces are scheduled to return to Narempita on the following day. Meanwhile, 408 COVID-19 infected persons have been detected in the country today. 14,629 corona patients continue to undergo treatment. 294 patients were cured today. The total number of recovered patients is at 513,092. The Director General of Health Services have confirmed 17 COVID-19-related deaths which have occurred yesterday. 11 of the fatalities were of the age of 60 years or above. There were six victims between the ages of 30 and 59 years. Meanwhile, the Director General of Health Services, Dr. Hema Daherat, says that there is an emergence of a new COVID-19 variant in the country and the Health Minister says it is taking precautions and steps in order to create awareness on the new variant among the public. He further emphasised on urging the public to adhere to necessary health guidelines to mitigate the spread of the virus. There have been new virus variant reported and uh, I would say that at this moment it is too early to officially comment on this new variant. Basically we are in the process of assessing the risk and getting the details of the new uh, so-called variant. Once the experts give their recommendations and their assessment on the nature of this new variant, probably we will in future or in coming days or probably in the evening, we will inform the real nature of what has been reported and until such time we will have to be careful and wait until whatever the control measures are published. However, again I would like to tell that there can be so many characters of this new variants which is different from other variants that we have observed to my knowledge. Most of these characteristics are not going to become resistant to the normal health measures that we are going to employ that is keeping the social distance and also keeping wearing our face mask and washing our hands and other respiratory etiquettes will definitely prevent the spread of disease so whether this is a new variant or not we will try our best to make sure that proper health guidelines are adhered all the time so that the risk of spreading any new variants will be minimal we know that there is another long weekend is approaching and we know that there are a large number of people who are expecting to go on holidays or leisure travels to us during this weekend and I would like to urge everyone who are planning such things, try not 
to go on unnecessarily on this kind of trips. You can postpone this trip. That will be the best thing because there are so many people who are again after a long time desperately looking for a trip or vacation or leisure itinerary to relieve their stress and other things. So unless it is essential, better to postpone things. And if you are going on a trip of this nature, again try not to go into places where a large number of people are gathering, especially to religious places or any other entertainment locations where large number of people are gathering. Try to spend your holiday or vacation in a calm and quiet place where no people or less number of people are gathering and try to make sure that we are not going to contribute to any spread of this disease because otherwise we will be again going back to the previous situation where we have to sacrifice most of our social and economic opportunities because of the high number of cases reported. Even at this moment the number of cases have not gone down below 500 which indicates that there is some kind of stagnation of cases reporting and therefore we will have to be very careful and make sure that we are not going to contribute to any way to spread this disease. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesman Wang Wengbing has said that in a statement yesterday, a declassified United States intelligence report saying it was plausible that the COVID-19 pandemic originated in a laboratory in unscientific and has no credibility. China called a new declassified U.S. intelligence report on COVID-19 unscientific on Sunday. The report claimed the pandemic could have possibly originated in a lab. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said in a statement, quote, A lie repeated a thousand times is still a lie, and added U.S. intelligence services have a reputation for fraud and deception. The U.S. briefing published earlier in the weekend said a lab leak in China was just as plausible an explanation as a natural origin theory to explain how COVID-19 first infected humans, but also that the truth may never be known. China has consistently denied allegations its virology lab in Wuhan was the source of the first outbreak, first identified at the end of 2019. A joint study by China and the World Health Organization published this year said COVID-19 most likely infected humans via the wildlife trade and all but ruled out a lab leak theory. But critics have said the study failed to investigate the Wuhan labs. The WHO established a new group last month to study the pandemic's origins and called on China to supply raw data to help the new investigation. China declined, citing patient privacy rules. On Sunday, Wang repeated China's calls for the U.S. to open its own lab in Fort Detrick to an international probe. Well, the anti-terrorist unit has informed the Colombo Magistrates Court today that a special investigation is being conducted on 702 Sri Lankan nationals detected via a mobile phone of a member believed to be having connections to the ISIS organization. Well, this complaint was taken up for hearing before the Colombo additional magistrate, Chandima Lirage. The anti-terrorist unit told the court that upon examination of the WhatsApp account in the mobile phone of the alleged member, details of 702 Sri Lankans have been revealed. It is also said that further investigations had led to the arrest of one suspect. The unit has also informed the court that investigations are also underway regarding the Sri Lankans who maintain contacts with the suspect. The chairman of the Presidential Task Force for One Country, One Law, Venerable Galagodate Nyanasara Thera, says that the objective of the task force is to build one nation which deviates from narrow divisions and lives together in harmony, respecting each other's cultural and religious heritages. The first media conference on the role of Presidential Task Force for One Country, One Law was held today at the Presidential Media Center via video technology. The Thera pointed out that in fulfilling that role, they will act according to a core policy framework and no citizen should be subjected to any difference or discrimination before the law on the basis of their race, religion, caste or any other factor. Venerable Gadagola Atte Nyanasara Thera emphasized that if the citizens can place their country as number one above all, regardless of their ethnicity, religion or political affiliation, rather, the task force is ready to listen to all opinions regarding the legal framework 
framework of such a country and further said that the presidential task force has a broad understanding on this issue. He said that the responsibility of the task force is to create a one nation that has get together under one flag and a formulate one law suitable for the country. The terror said that their responsibility is to create the necessary environment in this country to formulate one law that will bring together all the communities without being divided into Sinhalese, Tamils, Muslims and else Buddhists, Catholics, Hindus or Muslims. The youth of this country has suffered the most due to racial, religious and provincial divisions. Therefore, the youth have a special place in this process, he said, adding that all young people representing universities, higher education institutions and various organizations are invited to subject their ideas and suggestions to the task force. The Thera also said that he hopes to discuss the matter with all political parties, religious and civil society organizations and groups in the coming days and added that the discussions is open to all who come without any hidden agendas. The Thera said that after consulting all these sections, the views and recommendations of the task force would be submitted to the president within the given time frame. Professor Sumedh Sirivardhana, member of the presidential task force for One Country, One Law, stated that the task force has been mandated to make recommendations for the implementation of One Country, One Law concept in Sri Lanka after conducting a study. He said the presidential task force does not have the power to make laws, that it will be done by legislature. Minister Mahindananda Aludgavange says cultivations have commenced in 70% of the paddy lands out of the total area of the land that would come under paddy cultivation in the Maha season. The minister has made these observations at the inaugural ceremony of the Saubhagya Home Gardening Program held at the Ganorua Plant Gene Resource Centre in Peradeniya today. Minister Mahindanand Aludgamge said that an organized program, especially in the Polonaro district, is being carried out using farmers. He added that it was the paddy mill owners who are financing agitations in Polonaro. The minister also said that agitations were stopped and farts were started today. He also said that farmers are continuously demanding fertilizer and added that they have already sent fertilizer stocks to the farmlands. The minister further pointed out that the Maha season paddy cultivation target is 800,000 hectares of land. He added that by now, paddy cultivations have commenced in 500,000 hectares. Planting of paddy is already completed in 240,000 hectares of land. The minister has also expressed optimism of engaging in paddy cultivations in the entire 800,000 hectares of land. Minister Mahindananda Algamage further said that nitrogen fertilizer was brought to the island by four Indian aircraft this evening. Further stocks will be received in due course. He also said that the government is also providing 7,500 rupees each to 621,000 farmers for the production of organic fertilizer. Farmers in the Mahavali H zone have agreed to engage in cultivations in the organic fertilizer yesterday. They have requested the authorities to open the Kalawawa reservoir farming activities. Accordingly, sluice gates of the Kalawawa were opened today. Former Chief Minister of the North Central Province SM Ranjit also participated. The United Nations COP26 summit that starts in Glasgow this week has been billed as a last chance. However, the close of the G20 with little more than vague promises highlighted the lack of political urgency so far. Climate summit opened on Sunday, billed as a make or break chance to save the planet. But as one summit began, another ended the G20 in Rome, which highlighted doubts and anger over whether years of empty pledges would turn into political momentum. COP26's aim is to keep alive the target of capping global warming at 1.5 degrees above pre industrial levels, which scientists say is our only hope of avoiding catastrophe. As delegates began arriving in Glasgow, Scotland, COP26 President Alok Sharma said an August report by UN scientists was a wake-up call. It made clear that the lights are flashing red on the climate dashboard. That report, agreed by 195 governments, makes clear that human activity is unequivocally the cause of global warming. To the fury of protesters in Rome, G20 leaders urged meaningful and effective action on Sunday, but offered few concrete commitments. Even though the bloc of the world's 20 richest nations is responsible for an estimated 80% of all global emissions. A new pledge last week from China, the world's biggest polluter, 
to reach net zero, but not until 2060, was labelled a missed opportunity that will cast a shadow over the two-week summit. The return of the United States, the world's biggest economy, to UN climate talks will be a boon after a four-year absence under Donald Trump. But like many world leaders, President Joe Biden will arrive in Glasgow without firm legislation in place, as Congress wrangles over how to finance it. For any chance of success, COP26 needs to secure far more ambitious emissions pledges and lock in billions in climate finance for poorer countries. Pope Francis urged world leaders to listen to the cry of the earth and the poor. And back home looking at the weather situation. The Department of Meteorology says that the low pressure zone continues to remain in the location adjacent to Sri Lanka. As a result, many parts of the island would continue to receive intermittent heavy rainfall accompanied with thunder. Well, many areas in the Colombo district have been receiving heavy rainfall since last night. Arawala in the Maharagama Piliandra Road was underwater this morning. Our correspondents say that the vehicle transport has been disrupted. Incessant rains have also inundated several roads in the Ranga Divisional Secretariat Division. The Hangamo River, which flows across the Alapatha Divisional Secretariat Division in Ratnapura, was overflowing due to lashing rainfall. Several roads in the area are underwater. The continuing rains have risen the water level in the Kaluganga, closer to the spill level. Well, several low-lying lands in the northern province have also been inundated. It has also been reported that damages have been caused to many croplands due to overflowing of several minor irrigation tanks in the Bavunia district. A tree falling across a three-wheeler travelling in the heavy rain in the Anagarika Dharmapala Mahavata in Anuradhapura. The vehicle was severely damaged, but there was no injuries to the driver. Mounds of soil have fallen into the road between 23 and 24 kilometer posts of the Ravana L on the L Vallavai road this morning. Vehicle transport came to a complete standstill. Transport from Badula to Nanue was suspended due to falling of soil mounds on the railway tracks in several locations, as you can see. And also, the Med Department forecasts thunder showers with lightning from time to time in the western suburb of central, north central, and northwestern provinces, and also in the several locations in the Mannar, Badulla, and Goa and Matara districts as well. Well, Minister Uday Gammanpilla has presided over the inauguration ceremony of the Sri Lanka Petroleum Development Authority today. The Petroleum Resource Act of Number 21 of 2021 was approved on the 8th of last month. As a result, Sri Lanka Petroleum Development Authority has been established in place of the Petroleum Resources Development Secretariat. Well, the newly set up body is entrusted with the responsibility in performing duties relating to the regularization of oil exploration and the development in Sri Lanka. The administrative and managerial duties of the Sri Lanka Petroleum Development Authority has been relegated to the Board of Directorate comprising of four well-known specialists in the petroleum industry and five official members of the government, Chairman of the Authority Specialist and Petroleum Oil Industry, Sali Vikramasurya. Surat Ovitigama has been appointed as the Director General. The membership is comprised of Attorney at Law, W.J. Shavendra Fernando, Geologist, Dr. M.P. Vijayanand, the Chairman of the McLaren's Group of Companies, J.R. De Silva, an additional Secretary to the Minister of Power, Chamin the Hetyarachi. The other members include Director General of the Public Utilities Commission, Damita Kumar Singer, and Chairperson of the Marine Environmental Protection Authority, Darshini Lahandapura. Either the Secretary of the Ministry of Finance or one of its representatives is is also should be appointed to the authority. Minister Uday Gambampila said that the authority which was created today is the only hope for a brighter future for the debt-ridden Sri Lanka. What now remains to be done is to drill gas and oil. The new authority will be in full charge of these activities. Gas deposits have been detected with certain certainty in the plot named M02. The minister added that they hope to find suitable investors by conducting a public auction in the M02 block. He added that the entire world has been facing a massive economic setback. Many of the world's big companies have fallen into the loss-making status. Therefore, finding appropriate investors is a challenge confronted by the country, he said. Minister Gamini Lokuge says that Sri Lanka is working according to a plan to give up coal-powered plant 
plants and embark upon renewable sources of power by the year 2045, addressing a ceremony held in connection with the 52nd anniversary of the Salon Electricity Board today. The minister further said that the plan will be implemented in collaboration with the international community. The Salon Electricity Board had, had come into being on the 1st of November 1969, replacing the then Department of Government Electrical Industry. The CEB is an island-wide institution comprising of a permanent workforce of around 25,000 employees. The 52nd anniversary ceremony has been organized under the theme A Life Enriched with the Power of Electricity. A message delivered by the Prime Minister Mahindra Rajapaksa was read by Deputy General Manager of the Board, Engineer Noel Priyanta, at the ceremony conducted at the CEB headquarters. A CEB logo was also unveiled, symbolizing the anniversary of the institution. Chairman of the Salon Electricity Board, MMC Fernando, General Manager, Engineer M. R. Ranatunga, have also participated in the event. An advisory committee to upgrade standards in local rugby sport has been appointed. It was appointed by Director General of the Department of Sports Development, Amal Edrisuri, on the instructions of the Minister of Sports, Namal Rajapaksha. Well, this eight-member advisory committee will function under the leadership of Asanga Senibaratna. The membership includes Risley Ilyas, M.H. Maso, Delroy Fernando, Wing Commander Eranga Giganage, Rear Admiral A.S.L. Gamage, and Udani Edrisinger and Dr. Lal Ekanayaka. Here's more local news in brief. The sewing of cut in a robe of the 2021 State Cut in a Festival has commenced at the auspicious time at the... Kolumbagama Raja Mahabihare in Panduvasnuvara today. The festival has been jointly organized by the Presidential Secretariat, the Prime Minister's Office, the Department of Buddhist Affairs, the Northwestern Provincial Council and the District Secretariat. The state Katina ceremony will be held at the Kolumbagama Raja Mahabihare in Panduvasnuvara Varia Pula on the 14th of this month. A discussion in this regard was conducted today with the participation of Venerable Galagana PTA Premaratana Thera of the Viharia and State Minister Dayasiri Jayasekar and People's Representatives. For the first time after six years, direct flights between Paris City in France and Katnaika Airport has commenced today. The flight UL-564 of Sri Lankan Airlines has arrived at the Katnaika Airport at 4.50 a.m. today for the Charles de Gaulle Airport in Paris. Four new songs of four artists representing four eras were unveiled yesterday. Well, the set of songs have been named Malsaro. The presentation ceremony was held at the Foundation Institute in Colombo. The lyrics and the theme have been composed by Jagat Ratnayaka. The songs were from Visharada Nanda Malini, Keerthi Pasquale, Bimal Jayakudi and Harshana Disanayaka. Veteran musician Suresh Maliadda and Milinda Rajapaksha were also present on this occasion. Anything is possible. We need to wait and see. And this is the end of the news. Do enjoy the rest of the programs. Take care. Good night and stay safe.